That looks great. Thank you. Ooh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Excited to have you join us today. I would love, okay, first we all have to do our change every, change the chat to everyone from host and panelist. Tell us where you're calling in from today and how you're feeling. I'd love to know everyone's feeling. I'm, I just said that I'm having a very chaotic day. I don't know if anyone else out there is also in that space. I had to ask what day it was earlier. Um, but I'm still thrilled to be here. Hump day for sure. Yeah. My four-year-old keeps telling me that spring has sprung today. And I'm like, it, it has, it has. <laughs> um, so I don't know where you all are. I can see here in North Carolina, it's sunny in Portland. That's exciting. North Texas, Denver, um, Rochester, New York, where my brother was born, Hudson River Valley. <laughs> I'll be in the Hudson River Valley this summer. Can't wait for that. Um, love this. This is a very diverse set or audience today. I'm I'm uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, it's alongside right. Maureen. We actually live in the same town. We're a fully remote team, but we just happen to live in the same place. And Deborah, where are you calling from? Charlotte, North Carolina. So another C. <laughs> there we go. A lot of people um, accidentally think that Charlotte and Charlottesville are the same thing if you're not from this part of the United States, but close, but. Woohoo for Charlotte. I saw that, Drew. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, we can start to kick things off because we we're already three minutes in, but um, I just want to again, thank everybody for being here with us today. Um, we're going to talk about a topic that I feel like many of us are already pretty familiar with, which is the importance of managers and their role in all things like driving engagement, performance, ultimately the retention of our people. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Sarah Sheehan. I'm the CEO and founder of Bravely. And anyone here that doesn't know Bravely, we are a coaching and development platform that really focuses on the individual needs of employees across an organization. So at every level, we're really trying to think about, you know, how are we different as human beings? Like, all of us on this call have a different set of needs. We have different things impacting how we show up at work every day. We have different skill sets. And we don't believe in this one size fits all approach to development. Um, and you shouldn't either. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, this whole conversation around managers, I think, is, is really relevant to the work that we do. And we've actually um, changed our business quite a bit recently to sort of meet this need, like the, the evolution here um, that we've seen. Um, but I'll go into more of that, but I wanted to first um, introduce who I'm joined with um, today, our head of coaching at Bravely, Maureen Kennedy, and then Deborah Turner Bailey, who's the former a former DEI executive at Corning and is currently the CPO at WFAE in Charlotte. Um, and I'll let the two of you introduce yourselves really quickly. But again, like what we're really aiming for today in this conversation is to cover what I would call like the evolution that we've seen um, in terms of the roles and responsibilities of managers, what those new requirements are, and how we, those of us in the people space, can really support um, and invest in these, these managers. So I'll kick it over to the two of you. Would love to just have you introduce yourselves and maybe just share why you're excited about this combo today. I love it. I'll jump in. Let's do it. I'm Maureen Kennedy. I've been the head of coaching for almost six years at Bravely. Um, I'm also an executive coach for the past 20 years. 
I teach coaching at NYU in their um, master's program of executive coaching and organizational consulting. So you can tell I love to talk about coaching. And I always like to say like, I would prefer to have one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with each one of you on this call, right? That would be my preference. Um, yeah. My education and my obsession, I like to say, is organizational psychology. So I really love to think about how organizations work and how they can be more effective and make people happier in the workplace. And so also how to uh, help and support employees as they navigate the workplace. So to me, I always just love to think about how we could support managers, um, you know, to, to be happier at work. So I love to talk about what we're going to do today. Yeah. Deborah. Yeah, thanks, Maureen and Sarah. My name is Deborah Turner Bailey. I'm currently the Chief People Officer at WFAE, which is the Charlotte NPR affiliate. Uh, prior to that, I was a strategic uh, HR incorporated. And for a couple of decades, I have spent time from um, focused on leadership development, management development, supervisory development. So much like Maureen and Sarah, it's a passion for me. I think it's such a critical role in our organization. And I'm very excited to be here to talk about it today. I'm also a Bravely coach for the last three years. And so have lots of examples of where we've been able to have impact. Yeah, I'm excited to dig in to hear more real life examples. And at the end of this convo, we normally don't usually do this, but I would like to share some of the new products that we are standing up at Bravely. We typically avoid talking about those things on these because we want to have conversations really about like what we're all facing every day. Um, in the spirit of honestly getting your feedback, hearing your thoughts on the direction that, that we're headed um, at Bravely as well. And I always like to share too that I spent over a decade at the beginning of my career in HR and then I, I switched into sales and became a first time manager. And that, again, like as we talk about this conversation today, that was so formative for me as somebody that was focused for years on the culture and the productivity engagement of our people, but then actually being responsible for, in this case, a, a revenue centered team. It was like the shock of a lifetime. So um, I think this conversation is just, um, it's it, it seems like basic, but I actually think it's um, really important and I'm excited to have it. So the first thing I thought I would do today is, is kind of like anchor all of us around some of the data uh, associated with managers and also with the sessions, the coaching sessions that, that we've held at Bravely. Um, Barb, if you could pull up some of those, Barb is invisible, I think, but here, <laughs> thank you, Barb, you're the best. Um, but I thought it would be helpful for us to you know, just review some of, of the data around managers. Again, I think a lot of it is, you know, kind of we'll shake our heads because we've seen this before, but this is a more recent Gallup survey. 70% of the variance in team engagement is determined solely by the manager. Um, so when we think about ultimately the, the goals that we're all striving to hit, the direction that we're headed, you know, that's highly predicated on how plugged in our people are. And, you know, the data is showing that that has everything to do with the manager of that team, um, which I think makes sense. And that ultimately they are the ones that are driving organizational success. For every year a company delays investing in leadership development, it's it's a cost to up to 7% of their annual sales. Um, so you know, I think we're always tasked in the people role of figuring out like, how do we justify budget or investment, right? In different tools, resources or development of our people. I think this is um, a stat that absolutely makes that case. Uh, and, and I know that it's, you know, unique to every organization, but I think 
you know, we can all agree it's really important to make that investment and figure out like where are we actually going to see the ROI and whatever it is that we're investing in. I think that's a huge conversation that we have here at Bravely. Um, we'll definitely share this presentation with all of you. And then managers ultimately drive retention. I mean, we've all heard this, you know, comment that people don't leave companies, they leave their manager, right? One in two people say that they've left a job at some point to get away from a bad manager. I'm sure if we took a poll right now, um, most of us would be willing to just put it in the chat, not anonymously. I have definitely left a job because of a bad manager. Um, and it's, you know, it impacts everything, our well-being, how we show up at work, the quality of our work. Um, so, and, and I think a lot of managers uh, are terrible and don't want to be. Um, so again, some things we'll talk about today. And then we wanted to share more deeply and, and obviously, uh, Maureen and Deborah are the ones that are conducting these sessions and, and they can really talk more about, you know, what they're seeing or hearing on the ground, but these are the top topics that, that are, you know, coming to the surface within our coaching sessions with managers. They themselves want to figure out how to grow and get to the next level in their career. So despite them also being responsible for providing those opportunities the pe for the people that report to them, they're still gonna wanna understand like, how do I get to the next level? So that's a theme that's consistent. And then interpersonal and leadership skills. So a lot of times um, managers are coming to sessions really not understanding how to give feedback how to communicate to different types of people on their team. Going back to what I was saying earlier about like that need for individualized development and support, managers also have to take that perspective. You know, where you know different people are showing up every day with a different set of challenges, even at home, that might be impacting uh, their work. And they really need to understand like you know, maybe Maureen receives information differently than Deborah. And if I were their manager, I would really need to understand like how to communicate with both of them. And then finally, uh, leadership skills, which, um, you know, there's so many things that fall under this bucket, but uh, we've all heard, you know, the term like gr having gravitas or managing up. Um, you know, I think that's something that many of us struggle with. You know, even if we're a great manager, we may not necessarily like stand up uh, and are able to, you know, sort of like own our new role as a leader. Is everyone experiencing, is the sound okay for everyone? I see that somebody put it, okay, good. Um, sorry, Evie, I hope that you can figure that out. And then this will sort of set the stage for our conversation today because now, you know, managers need to do a lot more than we've seen before. They need to be able to build relationships, develop people, drive change, inspire, while still doing like all the work um, that's required of them. So again, just wanted to set the stage here for, um, you know, the impact that managers have on their employees, the workplace, the goals of an organization and, and what the new requirement is before we dive in. So we can get rid of these slides now, but as we think about, and I'm going to stop talking in like two seconds because you don't want to hear from me anymore. Um, but I do think it's important to start the conversation and focus on, you know, this, the, the investment in managers, it's not new, but I think it's dramatically changed. And those of us that have been in the workplace for a while, you know, over a decade ago, they were the only ones I think actually getting investment, like managers and above, like you, the conversation wasn't really about like, you know, cascading development across the org at every level all the time. Um, and I think that, you know, if we flash forward to recent years with COVID, what we see in social justice, like that shift really did focus, like there was a shift that where we started to focus on how do we provide support and development at scale. I think also like the great resignation, remember that term that's just like gone away. Um, that was a wake up call that quickly, I think demonstrated to organizations that 
you have to invest in more than just your managers if you want to retain your people. And so all of this, I think has been, you know, it's all of that is still true, but, and I'd love to actually hear in the chat, whether this resonates with you, it feels like we're kind of pivoting back or the pendulum is swinging back to, we need to invest more heavily in our managers where it was a, it was a little diluted over the last couple of years. It feels like we're, we're back into that moment where we're, we understand it's this pivotal role and we've got to invest in managers again. Um, so I'd love to hear Deborah from you and Maureen about how you've seen this evolution and what you think these these new expectations are because I think a lot of this renewed focus and investment is because managers aren't required and expected to do a lot more than they used to be. I'll start, um, Sarah, thank you. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. If I think back before um, the investment that we made in people who were non-managerial was really mostly around technical skills, right? And it was around, um, you know, preparing for the next level of technical uh, expertise. But there was also this sense of that um, your career would kind of evolve. It would, and that your manager was looking out for your pro progression, your development. As the reality of working remotely, COVID, all of that hit, and employees took more ownership and understood that more ownership was on them, they come to their conversations with their managers with a whole level of expectation that wasn't there before, I think. And so managers have to be prepared to uh, engage around that, right? And so um, I think the conversations have become different. And therefore, I think a reinvestment or thinking about how we invest in management development, leadership development, and the tools that we provide for them um, has taken on a new shape, a new flavor. Uh, and I can definitely hear that in my coaching sessions. Yeah. I would just add to that. First of all, I have the sun is like doing strange things. So I may turn into a ghost like halfway in the middle of this, right? Like I'm sort of like whitewashed over here. I'm like, oh my God, I'm turning into a ghost. Um, to add to what Deborah said, I think during COVID, you know, we talk about the managers were also responsible for emotional support and the well-being and the career development pathing for their direct reports. And, and also trying to like, do it for themselves at the same time. So a lot of those coaching calls were about like, put on your oxygen mask first, then get out there and like, you know, one person needs support today, the next person wants career development. So, I mean, when you were going through those slides at the beginning, Sarah, like my first thought is like, oh my God, there's so much pressure to be a manager right now. So in, in, some, yeah. in some ways I'm like, I mean, it's just like a pressure cooker. And, and in addition to that, you think about where the economy has kind of like, you know, we don't know where we are. We're, are is the bottom going to fall out? No, it hasn't. Oh, we're good. Like, so there has been this, like, maybe we're not going to hire more people. So you have people working with, like, they need another headcount on their team. They're kind of picking up the slack for, you know, what they, they can't, they can't hire anybody. So they have to do some IC work to make that happen. And so there's a lot more pressure. And at the same time, they don't want to lose sight of what they want from their lives. Right. And that career development. So yeah, when you said that, I was like, man, this is this is the time of times, right? Now that we're also adding more confusion with coming back into the workplace, this hybrid things that are happening too, or just the groundhog day of working from home, right? There's that that element. So yeah, I think we're I would, at Thanks, uh, Maureen. I just wanted to build on that because it is so true. I don't go through a coaching session with a manager where I'm not also focusing on their team, but yeah. on them, them as an individual and them as an employee wanting to have a certain level of conversations with their manager. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I'm reading these. You all are really showing up in the chat. I love when people do this, by the way. 
Um, one of the thing, one of the comments that just struck me was like, we need to invest in our managers so that they will invest in their direct reports. And I think that is so true. Um, and I've even recently had some aha moments about that personally with people on my team where I'm like, wow, you know, I'm so burdened that I'm not actually investing in them the way that they deserve to be invested in. And I think with managers in particular, with all the things that you just said, Maureen, like if, if we don't give them any space or tools to deal with the overwhelm that most of them are facing, it's impossible for them to yeah. even think about, but, but they have to, right? Not, and it's, they have to, because, you know, somebody's knocking on their door, probably pretty frequently and consistently, you know, asking for that investment themselves uh, and looking to them for, you know, not just guidance, but how do I, you know, get to my own next level in, in my career? Um, so I, I don't think we can talk enough about like this dramatic shift in, you know, the past where it was more about like tactical, yes, still driving results, but you weren't being expected to take into account even the personal side of what someone might be dealing with. Like, I, I do think is that I'm curious if that shows up a lot in your sessions, just, you know, I think we attributed it and talked a lot about this during COVID. We would say like, everything's shifted now. Like the, the workplace and home is kind of like melded together. And that's just never, I don't think going away, but I, I do think it's a, a challenging part of being a manager now is like, where is the boundary? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, does that show up in, in some of the sessions that you all are um, conducting with managers? I would say it absolutely does. And the analogy that I give is that we hear a lot about the burden on teachers in the school system, right? That they're dealing with the academic, social, emotional, all of those needs of the students that are showing up in their classroom every day. That is true for managers as well. Mm -hmm. That whole person comes to work, right? And so you're dealing with, you know, not only what's going on with their team and their project, but in the city that they live in and whether they've been able to get out and to connect with anyone. So when we say bring your whole self to work, that has a lot of implications for managers, right? And for what the coaching needs to be. Um, and again, not going into being therapists, but, you know, even just being a responsible manager and dealing with that whole person that shows up every day. Yeah, 100% agree, right? Just, I, I think that genie's not going back in the bottle and in a good way, right? It's now it's about time to, to make sure managers are supported to be able to do that work. And that there's there's enough bandwidth, energy to do it, right? And that they feel like they're capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think the impact in not investing in managers right now is? And and we can talk more about like what that investment looks like. But you know, somebody just commented that frontline workers are maybe disengaged, but their managers are even more disengaged. And the the idea of like, who do you invest in first, right? Like if, if you had to make the case, like, you know, talk us through like what the implications would be in, in not making that investment in these managers that become like the, they are leaders, but even bigger future leaders in the future, you know, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I'll jump in there. I mean, I know, Sarah, years ago, we used to talk about like, you know, just the focus on managers is like not enough. And we wanted to bring that kind of support at all and development at all levels, right? But there's yeah. a high cost for the organization and for each individual if the managers are not supported and do not get that development. So, and one thing I would notice, like, you can't just like, you know, put them through something and be like, okay, now you're supported. The, it, <clears throat> whole organization, you know, me, I'm more psych person, right? They, the whole organization has to support that, right? And so they have to be able to know what's going on and be able to really support the managers as they go through development. And so, yeah, I think there's a bigger fallout if 
if we don't really emphasize, and you know, the stats are in, right? They have like what, uh, is it like 83% of organizations know they need to focus on leadership development and only 5% do, right? So it's like, we know there's a problem there. There's a gap. The other thing that stands out for me is we've all known it. We've all said it many, many times. You can't just dip the managers into a training and lift them up and think that they're able now to go and to do the work they need to do, which is why I'm so passionate about coaching, why I think it really is a necessary tool or resource to add to any formal training. Because in coaching, you can be more specific. It really helps them to take what they just learned in a course or an article or a podcast and really apply it very specifically to their situation, the people Mm -hmm. on their team. Mm -hmm. And I always in my coaching say, let's think about this as an iterative process. Okay, you learned about a a tool or a model or whatever. You think you want to apply it to someone in your organization or to the team. Now let's talk about how that would work. How are you going to build on that? you know, really work with them. And so that relationship and over really two or three sessions can give that manager so much more confidence Mm -hmm. in how to apply what they just learned to their specific situation. And um, those are the times that I smile when I'm, you know, in a coaching relationship with someone. Yeah, I mean, transparently, I started a coaching company Maureen's the head of coaching for that company. Deborah, you're a coach. Like we, we, we're, we're not here to punt. We clearly support coaching. Um, right, right, right. But I always say that, especially now, like when you look around and, and I want to talk more about the other tools that we think are effective, but there aren't a lot anymore. If you think about it for managers, it's like, who's the leader that's supporting that manager that's overwhelmed one is critical and that is often not the right person or somebody that has the skills and when you look around like there's there aren't a lot of transformative resources like coaching that can actually get in there and and give somebody the space to say i can do this or because i i do feel like I mean, this wasn't like in, in my notes before this call, but it does kind of feel like we're in a, like a crisis with managers. I see it myself every day. It's, there's just, it doesn't feel like we can dig out of the hole. And the requirement is, is that we've got to understand like the nuances of everyone on our team and then have the skill, courage, um, and desire to give them feedback so that they can grow. That is asking a lot. It is really difficult Mm -hmm. to, you know, have these conversations. Um, and, and we know that because we track a ton of data through our sessions that the, the three biggest challenges that managers face are burnout, which we've, you know, already talked about the the need to do more with less, which Mm -hmm. you touched on Maureen, like that is just a theme across every customer, client we have. Um, and there, like, it feels like nobody has the work-life balance that we're supposed to have more of because we work, a lot of us work from home, but then there's also a real challenge around the requirement of creating a sense of belonging on their teams. And that communication piece that we were talking earlier about, like, how do I do this effectively? Um, and then motivating unengaged employees, like just saying those three things feels exhausting to me. Um, right. so let's talk about like, aside from coaching, which it works, it, it works because it supports people on an individual level. What are some of the other like tools or things that you think are essential for companies to be offering their people right now? Well, of course I, I'm sorry, Deborah, go for it. Uh, now, I, one of the key tools um, that I always start with people around is self-awareness, self-assessment. Mm-hmm. What do you know about yourself? What do you know about when you're at your best? Um, 
what do you know about your own preferred ways of communicating, ways of presenting, ways of working toward a decision? And so often I try to focus on the person in front of me first and just have them be reflective, think about it, and, you know, maybe look at some assessments that they've either had in their past. I know I've got 30 years of self-assessments on all kinds of instruments, and I frequently pull them out and look at them and say, what does that tell me about how I'm showing up right now, right, in this situation? So that's one that comes to mind for me. I love that, Deborah. I mean, I think it's so important. And like Gallup has all the data around like no identifying your strengths and knowing your strengths, leveraging your strengths makes you happier at work. You're more engaged, you know, you're more productive, right? Just so many times people just forget, like almost feel like they forget who they are, right? What am I really good at? And then how can I leverage that in the moment? So I love assessments. Um, and to your point, Deborah, when you talked earlier about trainings, right? It's like you, we all know the like in one ear, out the other with many trainings, right? But we do know that like, there's something there that we can build on with, of course, coaching, right? You can make it, put it into action, experiment with it. I love how you said iterate and iterate because I'm always like, let's experiment. Let's ex try it. Let's debrief on it. Let's see what worked, what didn't work, right? To make it your own. So it's like, how do we take, knowledge is not gonna be hard to find. All we have to do is chat GPT at anything you want right now, right? So how do we take it <laughs> And then make it ours and have a, you know, have a way to put it in action and be held accountable to try it and, and keep going. So, yeah. And I think too, Maureen, that uh, with the time pressure and the, like, I've got so many balls in the air, um, often managers are like, I've got to do performance reviews and they see it as a one and done. And I always ask them to think about it as a journey and that each interaction with their employee, each conversation is a data point. It's discovery. It's building uh, a foundation, the relationship. So not one and done, but like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm building a, um, a history with this person, right? And we all know from all of our rela other relationships in life, it's not one and done. It is history. It is what I know, what I've shared, when I've been willing to be vulnerable, when they've been able to be vulnerable. And we build on that and we carry it forward, right? So mm -hmm. that's another thing for me, Sarah, is to just reframe it as you're not just having the performance review. You're not just having a tough conversation, but that you're creating together something with this employee or with this team. Yeah. Yeah. I one thing, Sarah, one more thing to add there that I think is that it feels like, you know, managers, well, everybody needs this, but you know, there's talk of like everyone needs their own personal board of directors, right? There are some thought leaders that like to use that. I love thinking about that. And I always share that with employees. It's like, or a village, right? Don't we all need a village? village we need a village to get through work right so i see in the chat people are talking about mentoring and i'm like yes like but who's at this table for for the manager right is it like a mentor that's maybe from a previous role or is there some sort of program internally it's like you know is it i always say your best friend who doesn't care what job you have who's going to challenge you on everything right like who's at your board personal board of directors who's at these managers personal board of directors to get them through what they want, you know, to be successful and to be happy at work. So, yeah. So true. And, you know, we can facilitate this for our people. We can also encourage them to, you know, personally, I reached out to a more seasoned CEO in a B2B business recently, and it was very scary for me, but I need mentorship. I have mm -hmm. coaching, but I, I need somebody that's been where I've been that can, you know, tell me, the mistakes that they've made and also build my confidence that, that I can do this. Um, and I think we need more of that in the workplace as well. Like really, especially like in an environment where we don't have as many opportunities anymore, especially those of us who are working remotely to make authentic connections. We, we have to kind of force them yeah. and, 
we've got to help facilitate those for our people. Um, and, you know, these, I, I'm reading almost every comment and like, I, I'm like, don't forget to, don't forget to say this because it's sparking something in me. But I don't know if those of you on the phone who are managers have ever had this experience, but there are some people that report to you, Maureen reports to me, full transparency, where you don't really have to like, think about how you're going to speak to that person, right? It's like, because you just automatically, like you have a shared language or there's, it's easy for you. And I think that sometimes for a manager makes you believe that like, there might be something wrong with other employees that you, that you don't have that same connection with, or mm -hmm. you know, there's somebody else on my team that I can just, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to say hello over Slack. I don't have, you know, there's no pleasantries. I'm just like, hey, here's the question. And I know that it, that person's not going to receive it. And, but th this is where we go back to like that individualized, like everybody needs something different from us. And that's not wrong. It's just the requirement. And we've really got to help our managers understand that so that they don't get triggered by it, that they understand like my personality is different from this person. And and we can still work within the, the same environment and be successful, even though we're very different. Um, and yes, Jerry, like knowing your team's communication style is like, it's absolutely everything. Um, mm -hmm. Some people need a lot of details. Some people need nothing and we'll run with it. Um, and these are just like, it seems so simple, but, but managers need to be reminded of this um, because you do. Lorraine, you have to work harder for those relationships. And, and that is something that is really mm. um, and, and I think for the organization, Sarah, right? To have these different styles of thinking and approaching things is only and identities, everything. It's good, it's only going to make organizations stronger, but it means the manager has to be equipped to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Leah just said. Managers can also fall into the trap of playing favorites with folks that they communicate with the easiest, like without a doubt. Yeah. And that's bias. Uh, yeah. and, and that self-awareness piece that, that you just brought up, Deborah, which is like the foundational to coaching, right? That, that is for like, I, I just think it is like the value that coaching brings is you can't hide. You mm -hmm. will get stripped down in a coaching session to the point of like having to reflect on yourself. Um, and it's, but it's so key when you're managing other people. And it's also key because if you don't know yourself well enough to know what, what solution, what a resolution what way forward is actually going to work for you because if it's not authentic and if you're not committed to it the other person's going to know right away mm -hmm. right so it has to be something that you are comfortable with that you say yeah this fits within my values or my way I communicate and also respecting who you're communicating to but Authenticity is really, really important there. And I also just wanted to pick up on what Maureen said about that personal sort of um, board of directors or people who you have that you trust is to really think about that broadly. Uh, people are often uncomfortable, like I can't bring this up to my peers because I feel like, you know, I'm being, I'm competing with them on some level or I'm going to be judged by them. So broaden that circle. You've worked, if you've worked other places, people you know, right? People that are in different organizations. So really think about that really broadly about the kind of feedback and the kind of, uh, you know, sort of thought leaders that you want to have in your life that you can go to and, and talk to about what's going on for you and how you're approaching that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these are things that we should be, you know, teaching our managers and, yeah. and really making sure that you, I think we'd all be surprised at how little people know in terms of like how to invest in their team or develop them or, you know, so many managers are great ICs that get promoted 
they get more responsibility. They want to do a good job, but they have never, maybe, you know, some people are just good at it naturally. I mean, that is a thing, but most managers have to be intentional and really think about, um, you know, how they're showing up every day. And I, I think it's Barb, if, if you will pull up the slides again, I think it could be really helpful to highlight how we're approaching this at Bravely. And then Maureen can go deeper into like the skills that are required. And I think it might even be interesting for y'all to see what our training programs are based on. Sure. Cause you can borrow from all of this. You don't have to do it through Bravely. Like you can create your own internal program based on what we're doing. But basically in the past, Bravely was all about offering coaching at scale. We wanted every person at every organization, Zillow Group, New York Times, Pinterest, Etsy, Yelp, the NBA, all of their employees have access to Bravely. And that remains our mission. We want equitable access. We believe that everybody deserves this investment because it's so transformative. And that is what our Boost product will continue to do. Um, over time. Like this is the scalable solution that companies can offer so that everybody can access coaching when they need it. It's not necessarily like frequent coaching every week or every other week. Some people use it that way, but it's more about like, I have to have a one-on-one -on -one and, and I need support um, to figure out how to talk to my manager. Somebody could go into a, a session and like instantly get the support that they need to move forward and, and probably build a skill, quite frankly. But we've developed these two new products to really focus on what we're talking about today, which is this manager development. So our advanced product is about investing in leaders or future leaders with more high engagement coaching, longer term coaching that includes assessments and, and really helps managers figure out like, what are my strengths? Where do I need to lean into? Maybe it's like leaning into your strengths more, quite honestly, rather than mm -hmm. identifying your deficiencies. Um, but this program is unlimited coaching where, you know, like Deborah was saying before, you, you, you go in and you're able to have like the strategic partner that helps you figure everything out, which again is just a huge gap in the workplace. And then we've talked a, a lot, especially in the chat around someone even like basically presented the case for edge. Um, which is our training program. And we'll show you what those topics are because again, you can create this inside your own organization, but we've identified six skills that are required for managers in this new workplace that we're all living in. Um, but we also know that you can't just go into a training session and then get thrown back into the world the next day and expect to be able to not only retain it because all the data shows us that we cannot, but implement it. Um, and so what we've done is created a program that combines both training and coaching together. Uh, and we've structured it in a way that people can actually afford it because the thought of doing both is probably like everyone here who tries to get budget is probably like laughing right now, thinking like we can't afford that. Um, but we we are really committed to this because of of everything that we've said today. Like managers want to be able to be more inclusive, give feedback, but they don't know how to do it. So we teach them, and then we partner with a coach so that they can go deeper and figure out like how do I implement this tomorrow in my daily life. Um, and so the combination of those two um, is really powerful. Sarah, did you want me to give like examples or we want to roll into the next to, to more detail? Based on uh, totally up to you. Yeah. I mean, it's more valuable. Of course, this of course Deborah and I have like a thousand examples, right. That we'd love to share. So Deborah, we could feel free to tag team, but I thought I'd just give it like an example of boost. Cause when we say the moments that matter, it kind of sounds like a tagline, but um, so I, I still coach on the platform. I love staying on the platform and seeing who pops up. Right. So I can think of in the past couple of years with one organization that we serve year over year, working with a director who wanted to become a vice president, right. Setting those career goals. And so those conversations at the beginning were just on a quarterly basis thinking about, okay, what do I need to do to create my own like next level 
How can it be held accountable? What's going to get in the way, right? Those conversations. But in between there, we had all the conversations, right? It's like, okay, you got a new peer. How are you going to influence both up and to the side? Like uh, performance reviews are coming out for this growing team. Like how do I make them like um, equitable and fair? Like these performance reviews, how do I make sure I motivate people, continue to coach and delegate and all the things that need to happen there. And then, you know, during these up and down times, there was like, uh, I got to lay people off, right? So the, you know, the, the, the executives, uh, the director's coming to me being like, this is going to be the worst day ever. And I'm like, I'm here for you, right? What do you need from me, right? And then the turning the corner and really getting um, the chance to do that leveling up and getting the uh, influencing um, leaders and getting promoted by the end. But using it, if you look at it from a distance, you're like a few sessions here and there, a few sessions here and there, another few sessions here and there, right? It wasn't a set program on a set amount of time. And so to me, that's really the moments that matter are all the moments that matter throughout our work life, right? When I think of advance is more this six month or 12 month program. So it's really about take what our uh, leadership skill assessment, take that assessment, you know, use that as a self-reflective tool to be like, you know, what, what am I doing well now in the past 30 mm -hmm. days? Yeah, I love it. Okay, so yeah, this is our leadership skills model that we created because we know with coaching, we've been capturing seven years of data of coaching sessions from employees and from um and from coaches seeing which skills we're building right in the sessions right so those three areas self-development managing relationships and leading teams right we know this is happening but when we started to build this model out um we knew that we had to like look externally to see what what um skills, leadership skills, like you've got McKinsey in the World Economic Forum, all these external coaching resources as well as like, what are people saying the skills that we need for the future? So we looked at our own data, we aligned with it and we say, these 27 skills on the outside, it's our stake in the ground for what future leaders must have, right? And so we use this as part of that advanced product that we have to reflect on our, our skills at the beginning as leaders and coaches really helping the uh, manager look at those skills and see what's showing up for them. To Sarah's point, they might end up leaning into their strengths more. And then taking it again at six months and 12 months, what's shifted and changed, right? And, and how can it inform the coaching agenda to really aim for something to happen, something to be different in the next six months? And what we see is people are just going to be happier at work. They're leaning into their strengths. They're learning skills along the way. So, oh my God, I could just keep going. Sorry, you're going to have to cut me off. Um, <laughs> and then I would say, you know, this is kind of the basis for everything. When we look at our edge product, right? It's all rooted in all of this as well. So if you think about, I know, Sarah, you can go through this, but just on a high level, when we think of edge as learning and coaching, it's everything that Deborah and I are talking about, right? If somebody goes through a well-being of course, I can think of a manager that I worked with after she went through the well-being and her team of course. And it's like, how does she use those really practical frameworks and tools to put in place with her team right there, right? Like right after the session and get it going. And so really we became accountability partners, seeing what worked, what didn't work to really, just, and how does it connect? I know it's, it's, it's like, how does it connect to who she wants to be as a manager? Because if it doesn't connect, it's gonna be like, I tried it and it's done. But if it connects to who she wants to be, then it's gonna stick, right? So Sarah, I'll let you jump in there and, and talk more details on this. Yeah, I would just say that I think all of us have been through some sort of training where we get really excited about the content and what we're learning. I mean, I've been through all of our six sessions multiple times and I promise you, I learned something new each and every time where it reinforces something in me that I know I need to be doing and I'm not doing it. Again, it's easier for me to give feedback to some people versus others. And, and also I think as managers, there's not, there's nothing wrong with us even questioning, like, should I be doing this? Or, you know, we're, we're human beings, right? But right. we've got to drive towards the goals that are in front of us. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think the hard part is, how do we help people? And this is what, probably what anybody in a people role is struggling with. 
How do I help somebody? I just spent $50,000 on a training program for all my managers. And now how do I help them integrate this into their lives? You're yeah. probably not going to, if you don't have a team around you or directors or, you know, managers of those managers who are really effective because we don't retain this. We're too busy and we want to, right? So it has to be in reinforce it. It has to keep happening, which is why I think in, if you were to do this yourself, it's about like, again, identifying the themes that are important for your organization. Like, I think all of these courses that we've developed are essential. And if you go to the next slide, there's three more which is leading with EQ, inclusive leadership, well-being in your team. I would say like these three are actually, these, these are foundational to the other three, right? If you aren't able to connect with your team and understand where they are, help them navigate, you know, their own stress levels and workloads, you're not going to be able to give feedback or coach them. The, the trust won't be there. And if you're not an inclusive leader, nobody's going to trust you, especially people on your team, you know, who are underrepresented. Um, and then that all is wrapped up in EQ. There's the question around like, can we learn EQ? Can you teach it? Um, and I think all the data shows, yes. I think if you help people with that self-awareness and, and get them to really you know, put themselves in other people's shoes, which is what coaching does beautifully, you know, they're able to then stand up and, and not just think about like, how am I being perceived right now? Because they're more focused on the people that they're serving and, and creating like more of this servant leadership. But um, these are the six themes. And, and my recommendation would be, you know, think about like these, I, I, I think they would be considered like soft skills in comparison to, uh, the hard skills that that we were all getting trained on 20 years ago, but they they're required now, right? So figuring out like how do you talk more about this um, from a leadership perspective and make sure it's part of your culture, and then figuring out if it's not through coaching, if you don't have the budget for these tools, you know, can you create mentorship programs or mechanisms to reinforce it, like through your performance review process or through you know, really helping to shape how one-on-one -on -one should be conducted. Mm -hmm. I think, Sarah, that's really, really critical. And they may be considered or used to be considered soft skills. I think they are foundational skills, right? Yeah. For anyone who is leading a team or in an organization um, these days, because that that self-awareness, that resilience, that ability to take care of yourself means that you're going to be able to do that for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the power skills, right? You hear people saying power skills now and it makes sense, definitely. And the ripple effect, right? Really being able to support and develop your managers and see that ripple effect of what happens within your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen quite a few comments or questions around, you know, in a moment where I think a lot of companies are, you know, driving towards profitability or, or making cuts. Um, you know, this is, this is, that this, this is a reality. I think that's very difficult to navigate and there's, I mean, we're be, we're highly focused on figuring out like how to help our potential clients and clients continue to make the case for this because it's not those sitting in a people role that are wondering whether this is valuable. Uh, it's, you know, convincing other people uh, that are in senior level roles, the significance of this kind of investment. Um, and people don't stay at jobs as long as they used to. Um, but I don't think there's any reason that we can't turn that around, honestly, because I think if someone feels valued and they feel like, again, like all those stats point to the manager, if we can really develop these qualities in our managers where they support people and they are more in line with that servant leadership, I think we would we would see people sticking around and doing their best work. Mm -hmm. And I think even when people are involuntarily impacted, if they've been treated with dignity and respect, and if they feel like the organization has valued them 
for what they brought at that time, you're going to have an ambassador out in the world that's going to talk about your organization and what a good experience that was, even if it even if it did not um, extend beyond three years or two years or one year or whatever. Uh, I think that's the reality that many, many people understand today. Um, but it makes a it makes a difference if they feel that way working for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Laura, send me a message on LinkedIn and I'll help you. Uh, <laughs> any parting words? I, I just, I love these two women so much. Um, I would like every conversation to be the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you have so much wisdom to share. Look, I, I love what you said. Like it does, you know, it doesn't have to be us, right? But if you're thinking about everything that we talked about today is like, how do you support your managers? You have to, it's going to be intentional. How do we reinforce some learning? How do they like work with their peers? How do you create mentors in that village or that personal board of directors? So it's like, we know the work that everyone on this call is doing to really support managers. And it's like, it takes so much intentional time and effort, but it's worth it, right? It's really worth it. Amazing. Um, these are just some of the comments from some of the people that we've worked with, but want to thank everyone for this. You all have made this conversation very rich, by the way, like we're, we're on the screen, but what you have put in the chat has like just opened my eyes to thinking even differently in an hour. It's amazing what can happen. So um, thank you so much for being here, for participating. Um, We'll be in touch with with more conversations in the future, and I hope you can join us. Here's your SHRM and HRCI information. Um, and please connect on LinkedIn, uh, reach out to us if you want totally, to. Yeah. Information. Um, and have a great week, everybody. Thanks, everyone. It's great. Take care. Take care.